need to worry about your pre-recorded music tapes being accidentally erased. It can't happen. All cartridges include a special feature that makes accidental erasure of pre-recorded tapes impossible. So simple, so convenient, so practical, so easy to use, and with all the unquestioned advantages of tape, now ready to move the tape recorder out of the closet and into the living room. By 1988, I was putting out over 100 cassettes a year. My mother loves to tell this story of when I was living in India as a child. Uh, she caught me one day and I was scratching my head up here and I was scratching my face and scratching my head and she's like, what are you doing? I said, well, this sounds different than this. And at that point she knew that uh, that's what she always used to tell us a story when she knew I was, I was up to something in the sound world. By fourth grade, I was playing violin, and then I played in orchestras throughout high school and one year in college. And uh, it was that transition between high school and college when I started realizing about new music. Breaking down that classical thing that was sort of blowing up and not no longer being interesting to me, and the uh, exciting and anxious stuff that was coming up in the new wave and punk and experimental things and the John Cage message of just like wow all everything is safe to do When I first discovered music, it was that little crystal radio that my mom and dad had. It was on my bed, and it was like, this was pre-Beatles, and it was like, I don't know, the Drifters or something, and it was like, oh my God, this is like magic. The Stones, the Beatles, the Who, the whole, that whole early rock stuff was just, I, I just ate it up. It was just really eager for that. However, and then I discovered Zappa. <laughs> This is pretty early, maybe 67, maybe something like that. One of my friends had freak out. And then that kind of opened my eyes because I read about Zappi, he talked about Varez, he talked about Boulez, he talked about his influences. I went to the library. In the pre-internet, you always had to go to the library. Got Varez albums, and all of a sudden there's this different world all of a sudden. I go, wait a minute, this is not music in the way that I know it. When I was six years old, my father was uh, sort of a hi-fi enthusiast and brought back all kinds of interesting um, things, well, interesting to me, like reel-to-reels and stuff from, from his work in, in Asia. And so we had the tools of making uh, recordings and stuff like that at home. I expressed an interest in drumming uh, to him at the same time because uh, I, I thought, well, wow, what a great thing to play in a band, but I don't want to be in the front. And so uh, he would introduce me to drummers, uh, probably against his uh, better judgment, because I think he would rather have, have been an engineer or something. Uh, but anyway, so it caught on, and I started playing drums officially uh, when I was 11 years old. Uh, my father passed away quite young and left behind all this stuff, and uh, he would never have let me do what I started to do with these reel-to-reels when he was gone. I just had some ideas that I could bang microphones together and record those and see what, what happens, what comes out of it. As a 14, 15 year old, that's, that's quite interesting. It's like, it's like making things, you know, making 
uh, making toys, but making toys out of noise, out of sounds and things like that. So, so I started early. I was a teenager. I was forced to move to Des Moines, Iowa, which I absolutely despised. And I have I developed this hatred for mainstream anything. Mainstream music, mainstream movies, anything mainstream. And Des Moines, Iowa, anyway, is a horrible place to be when you're a teenager. You don't want to be there, seriously. And so I was, try, I was seeking out unusual music. I wanted anything different and just creative, you know, that wasn't like whatever was big back then. I don't even remember. So I started with Talking Heads, The Clash, Elvis Costello. I mean, that was the weird experimental of its time in Des Moines. You know, if you could find Elvis Costello in a record store, that was doing something to find that. So from Talking Heads, it was, I mean, I have to credit Talking Heads with, um, me discovering Dada. Which, oddly enough, in Des Moines, Iowa, there is a library where you can't check out these books, but you can go there and sit and they're like reference books and it was this massive library on Dada in Des Moines, Iowa and I found it. <laughs> I found it and I was like yes! So I would spend every day just sitting in this library reading these books. They were awesome and learning about every... I became a total expert on Dada. It was like I was like a sponge. I just kind of absorbed it, you know? I wanted... I was so hungry for anything different. I moved back to Indiana and very quickly met Hal. Two, three. <laughs> oh, I you mother, I, I see white spots in the sink. This I is the voice I heard anything. glued to a paper Look clip. Perfect is the glass, rats to be the reason. Just as intelligent. God, I'm flying up your nose. The man is worried and counts his green pennies. And singing a song, We're and I don't know the coat hanger who just gave me a tip. I loved weird. I mean, not just for the sake of it, but because it was creative. You know, it it it, it was. It just was everything to me. I guess the path that led me to experimental music was in high school and early college. I was interested in Bob Dylan, which led to an interest in Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg and the beat poets, which led to an interest in William Burroughs. And then from William Burroughs, I started getting interested in, in stranger experimental types of music. It wasn't until October of 1981 when I met Debbie Jaffe that I really started finding out just what experimental music was all about. This was something that with no boundaries, it was a type of expression that wasn't limited by melody, by beat, by rhythm, by any of the typical structures or restrictions of popular or classical music. Anything went. I mean, it was as broad as your imagination, which uh, really appealed to me because I always rebelled against restrictions especially our, you know, restrictions in thought or expression or whatever. So it seemed to me that with experimental music, uh, anything went. That was exciting. I was an ugly girl. Bring me back to a primitive way. I was an ugly girl. Make me proud of being a spray. I was an ugly girl. Ugly girls deserve happiness too. An ugly girl would think the world of you. Well, you know, like a lot of people at various phases, my mother first encouraged me to take guitar lessons when I was 12, and 
bought me a guitar and, uh, and, and we got an amplifier and I learned how to play and uh, then I, I, I joined bands with the, my best friend who lived across the street. We played a couple of dances playing mostly Creedence Clearwater Revival songs and stuff like that. Really, you know, cheesy, normal, stupid stuff, but it was, you know, got my, get me into music. But then I gave that up. I gave it up because I was listening to Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and I knew I could never be that good, so I, I, I gave it up. But then punk happened. Punk happened, and then I thought, well, I could do that. And then I, I was going through a phase of my life when I was feeling very alienated and lo and felt I couldn't relate to anybody and not that I've really gotten over that. So then when me and Evan Cantor decided to move out to Colorado, I, I stopped at my home in New Jersey and then I took my guitar with me to Colorado. And we first started recording some of my little Theodore songs on Evan's recording equipment. Uh, you give me hard on. You give me hard on, you make me fall. You give me honey, go and go. You make me horny, you make me lust. You make me fear that I feel a bust. You make me want you, you make me cry. Because I both know I'm qualified. Ha! You give me hard on, you make me ride. You make me think of Mr. Pie. I want an ugly girl. Useless shit. Uh, nobody loves me, and they got good reason. Songs like that, and then Walls of Genius started to happen when we decided to do more experimental music in Walls of Genius. It, it became something that I got into more that way. <laughs> Last night I took a walk after dark to a swinging place called Palisades Park to have some fun and see what I could see. That's where the girls are. I took a ride on a loop de loop. The girl I sat beside was almost cute when it was through. She was holding hands with me. My heart was flying up. But meanwhile, I had written these songs, and I started writing more, and Walls of Genius broke up, and then I switched to doing Little Theater Solo, which is kind of punk, which is mainly because that's kind of about all I can do. I like the energy in punk. I like, like the directness of expression. Kind of more punk than I've ever been now that I'm 56 years old. <laughs> this was the last Architect's Office cassette. Say that again. This is Cadenza Coda. What was the most unusual cassette you ever got in the mail in terms of packaging? Most gorgeous is uh, over here. I think this was the most gorgeous. It was from that Japanese fella. Uh, this one I think is real party. Ex Malo, isn't that a pretty one? Is that the way you say it? Y-X-I-M-A-L-L-L-L-L-O-O, -L 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 Ex Malo. Cassette culture thing, yes. So talk about cassette culture. Well, you know, I've, I, my, I had written, uh, you know, the diatribes about that as well, that, you know, he, he, about the virtue of the cassette. To me, it was a great thing that you could self-publish on a cassette, and it was small and convenient to send. I mean, what else were you going to do? I lived in a house, it was called Big City, and there's Big City Central, Big City North, South, East, and West, and in there, there was about, oh, maybe 30 different people. Many of them were musicians. Some of them were very good. Some of us decided we wanted to play, too. Um, so we did, and uh, since it was Big City, we became the, the in-house orchestra, and whenever there was a house party, we played the house party. It was the big city orchestra. orchestra. Oh, okay. And for some reason we have never had the good sense to drop it. Always listening to music. Uh, strange music probably started with Dr. Demento. This is 
the project we've been working on for about 20 years, 22 years. It's salty sea shanties for young pirates. Although we had to take off the young pirates because they're really dirty. Um, so it comes with the vinyl, it comes with lovely art. Um, and right now we're working on each one's going to be different. So Robo made a lino and we've been lino printing them all, 500 of them. And then we're hand coloring them all and rubber stamping them all and uh, including the lovely cassette and crossbones. We're having parties where we have artists come over and we'll get like six or eight artists and two or three big folding tables here. And we're working on the last one we did all of the cutting, all of the printing, and now we're coloring in. So we've got another uh, party coming up soon and uh, get all How these How much does each one cost? I think they'll probably be like 10 bucks. So, not at all commiserate with the amount of effort put into them, of course. Here's a good example of a fun uh, cassette release of Soviet France and uh, uh, the lovely radioactive feather inside there, which I lick all the time. Um, this one did not come to me in the mail. It's a, oops, a steel plate. with the little cassette inside, the cassette inside. I still have boxes and boxes, as you can see. Um, I'm gonna make him uh, show some of these, but I probably have oh, 15, 20 wooden boxes like this filled with all of the great fun packaging, you know, the Rising from the Red Sand series. That was great. Boy, was that a great series. This is a cardboard tube that's been covered with uh, magnetic tape, recording tape, and then there's the information for the show, you know, any kind of strange packaging you could do. And we did a few of, as well as ourselves. From probably about 13, I wanted to be to play music or do music, and I just found a dissatisfaction. I mean, again, I liked pop, I liked you know rock music, and there was just something that struck me here that was just it wasn't regular. It wasn't. I mean, part of part of my feeling about it is this kind of stuff is not, this kind of music and sound is uh, you can't be manipulated quite as easily by this. So that in rock, pop, music, movies, um, books. You, your, your actual uh, emotions can be totally manipulated by how the writing is, how the filmmaker make, makes it, how the pop song goes, you know, just brings you to tears or, or, or laughter or whatever. And I think a lot of it was just a desire not to be manipulated by the media. You're facing your own, not demons, but your own preconceptions about what's music, what's sound. I remember the first audio experience I had was probably about 12 or 13 years old. And I had a tape by Bill Cosby, cassette tape, and he was talking. And there was a phrase that he said, he was going to say money, but he corrected himself and he said bread. And he said, m uh, bread. And I just liked that phrase so much, so I kept 
hitting the little rewind button <laughs> on it. And I'd sit for an hour and just hear uh, bread. When I was going to university in Santa Barbara at UCSB, they had an electronic music lab there. And that was just it for me. I loved it. You could uh, block off time as a student in the lab, so I'd block off the last hours of the day, go in about 10 o'clock at night, and just come out when the sun's up in the morning and making my own electronic music. They had actually this one right here. It was my first one I used in the lab, the ECM. They had a Putney VCS3, and then they had a room that was just full of Moog from floor to ceiling, and uh, it was fantastic. So I was doing my music there, and um, after I left college, I'd had all of this stuff that I'd put together for the last four or five years and decided um, I want to get it out there. I want to put it out on cassette, start a label, and that's what I did, Swinging Axe. Growing up with music my entire life, um, my dad's been a DJ for 48 years, so I had music constantly around the house at all times, and I had a turntable since I was about five years old. I had already been through all the rock stuff, and I was, you know, trying to listen to something that was different, you know. But when punk came along, you know, we had our local record store in Port Huron called Full Moon Records, and they had everything from Cabri Voltaire to Wire to everything underground. My life-changing single that I listened to was Nag, Nag, Nag by Cabri Voltaire. I mean, when I heard that, I said, this is it for me. This is what I want to do. I, anybody can make this kind of noise. You know, I love it. So, uh, you know, that was a, a pretty big changing moment for me. Cassette culture, by definition, is people that record with cassettes. Um, uh, it was a cheap format at the time. I was one of the first ones to get one of those Tascam Porta One studios. And so, you know, playing one track on top of another was like a revelation. You know, you couldn't do that with computers at the time. So it was like, wow, you know, I can put sound on top of sound on top of sound. And uh, it was it was just incredible. Cassette culture to me, it was just a cheap uh, format uh, in order to trade music with people, uh, do collaborations with people. This section here is all my uh, my personal uh, tapes that I've recorded. All these and these shows are tapes that were on my label, the ITN label or Exotech music label. Uh, bootleg cassettes by SPK, Throbbing Gristle and everything else is behind the Tiki. Uh, a lot of uh, local in, uh, industrial bands uh, from Columbus are in here including Evolution Control Committee martyr colony and body release and then these are just uh, mixed tapes that I've made these are more uh, Cabri Voltaire clock DVA hunting lodge uh, that kind of stuff and uh, and then this is just miscellaneous stuff here I don't know why but cassettes are in the stores these days. You can get blank cassettes, you can get cassettes by people that are local. I think the big thing about it is, is it's, it's a physical thing again, you know, people like physical items. Imagine what things were back when people communicated with music before there was any modern technologies or 
avenues to to do it you know, it's like a core connection that continues to uh, thread everything together and make it more like a communal experience you escape from the, the given and you try something new and find out it's much more rewarding and fulfilling to uh, experience it on that level so uh, I think that's what is the juice so to speak of the whole scene is that you have that one-on-one -on -one and uh, more personal intimate relation with the human factor behind uh, the sound. The cassette culture is just like, the cassette just was the thing, you know, it could have been a, a rock that you can record on culture if it was a rock you could record on. I mean, it was just, it was just like, it, we, it can happen to praise Philip for 50 years ago introducing a, a common, unified, inexpensive uh, media which we all had access to the mechanism of both recording and playing back. You had the power to be part of the conversation that seemed to be a conversation that was media, companies, radio stations, magazines, and books. I never considered my tapes demos. These were the finished art projects. These are the, pro this is not a demo for something I'm going to do. This is the thing itself. I think cassette culture refers to the, the era of 1980s to mid-90s, essentially. The early 80s, everybody wanted to make an LP and a record. And, hell, that was too expensive. And once you make the LP, you get 500 of them in your garage. I wanted to move on to the next tape. And that was the cheap, affordable nature of cassettes were the, were the ideal medium. Home taping continued on. It continues on today. And yet, uh, I wonder if you have the same kind of trading idea, the same kind of community. There's a lot of electronic bands now putting out new tapes. Most of these are not on Maxell or Memorex. These are like professionally duplicated because nobody's got a cassette deck anymore to make. I always made my tapes from one cassette deck to another. I don't think it's coming back in the same way that, it, that we had it before, because I would just go down to the drugstore and buy some Maxell 60-minute tapes, make my little cassette, and I would copy my tape and put my covers on it, and there you go. My collection consists of around, ooh, I would say about 5,000, maybe a little over uh, 5,000 home-recorded cassettes. We're gonna take a quick walkthrough of uh, just a, a part of my cassette collection. I I work in a grocery store, so I was able to collect stuff that was able to hold tapes because I want to have access to my tapes. And what I did was um, kiwi kiwi fruit used to come in these wooden boxes. They don't anymore, but they used to come in these wooden boxes. We were throwing away the Duracell battery setters after their time had passed at the store, and I realized that the kiwi boxes fit exactly in to the Duracell bat battery center. I want them to be accessible, you know. I like, I like to have access to stuff. If I want to play it or if I need it for my web research. A guy sent me, he made his cassette look like a radio. That's cool. Um, another one of my favorites, a guy named Peter Catham. He did a tape called Gum in which the cassette tape is actually in the seven inch tape box crawling with tarts and they put cassette tapes leaves little textiles pieces of paper they were true they are true artists 
and they did a lot of cool stuff. So these had a lot of the new cassette tapes that I've either bought or received. Um, here's some of Hal's new tapes. Then I have some international artists from Japan, uh, France, all over continental Europe and Australia. Here's my, my two tape set called Pinata Party, which you can see I stole stuff from work from strawberry cases. Um, my son had a, had a, a, a pinata party that we actually put on. We put some of the confetti. I put two tapes, balloons, stickers, and candy, and uh, stickers that I got from the grocery store, of course. Viscera. I mean, we were, it was a duo, Viscera, me and Hal. And I thought, well, this is weird stuff. No one's going to get this. No one's going to want to. Who's going to want to distribute this? This is like just so personal and so weird and wacky. And then Eon Kent from Eon Distributor in Colorado, he said, yeah, I'll take some. And we're like, whoa, you're going to distribute Viscera? My God. I did not think that what we did was really going to appeal to people and when it did start people did start getting it I was like wow you got that really <laughs> I'm amazed because I don't know why I mean why did we do it if I didn't think but people did but not in Indiana of course but everywhere else people are like yeah viscera cool this this is really um, you know it's it's uh, very uh, primitive, it's primordial, it, it really expresses something that, that people weren't expressing in the early to mid 80s. Well, I came across Op Magazine, was probably what, what started it, I suppose. And there were other, other magazines as well, Fact Sheet 5, that you could actually buy in record stores in Hollywood. And uh, so I su subscribed to them. It's, you know, they opened up a huge world of stuff, um, including things like finding out that there were other subscribers to Op Magazine in Ventura, where I was living at the time, that I could go meet those people and uh, do, do stuff with them. They, they sort of set up a world where I could then uh, I realized I could make cassettes and send them to these magazines and, and people would say something about them and, and then other people would write to me and, and order them. So even before that though I had done a little bit of mail art and already, already was enjoying this idea of sending things back and forth in the mail. Uh, so, so magazines really sort of opened up this, this, this world. It really exploded in, in this time when you could do things like uh, send a cassette and get it reviewed in uh, op magazine or whatever and then and then 40 people write you or send you their cassette and this networking thing came to the point where th there was a time in the early 80s where I was having to answer I don't know 10 or 15 letters a day you know which is an, which is amazing and I sort of miss it now and these are packages coming in with music and other magazines and all kinds of exciting and interesting things actually we we started making a magazine called Youth Go Camping. Uh, this was from a punk rock band that, that I was in, in Ventura. Um, we, we made a magazine to go along with it, a zine. And uh, this one's from, I think, 80, 83 or something like that. At one point, and this was pure serendipity, you know, we were in the process of doing the magazine and we had pretty much were focused at that time mainly on vinyl you know singles and and 12 inch vinyl and cassettes started to crop up and we felt like we wanted to you know address that i mean there was clearly something was happening and uh i mean it's easy <laughs> in hindsight it's easy to see what that was but at the time it was like wow there's something going on here so we should do a cassette column, you know. We just saw something was happening, you know. It's like, oh, there's like geologic activity over here. We should like watch, you know. So we opened it up and we started doing the listings and asking people to send their cassettes and we had no idea. That was right at the 
upslope of what now people look back and go, oh yeah, the DIY era, that was, DIY, you know, and that's really what was going on. People uh, were able to buy those little mixers and stuff, those little Fostex machines uh, and stuff like that, and were able to make cassettes and, and the idea that you could decorate the package and fairly cheaply uh, produce small batches of these things. It was perfect for the kind of thing, you know. Uh, singles at that time were the way a lot of people were doing music, um, at, or or twelve inch vinyl, and the minimum orders were a little higher, and it was more expensive to get into it. So I think people gravitate towards cassettes because you could do it on a really small scale. Somebody had me as a, they had me as a guest teacher for their communications class, telling them about the the cassette movement of the eighties. And I and the teacher said the big the main thing she got from me was that uh, was the connection with the with the zines, and I wasn't even going out, I wasn't making a point of of that that just came out in what I was talking about. It was part of the communication, and there was a way to get reviewed, and even if it was only in a you know a little you know carb in a little uh, Xerox magazine that only 30 people were going to read at least you kind of felt like you were just totally masturbating that there was somebody out there paying attention so it was a lot of fun it was and it was it was a real give and take kind of thing between all the musicians and and the the the, the, the zines it was total give and take total hand in glove experience this is really rare the num first issue of beyond the pale and um I don't know, we, this kind of started it. This was a zine that was put out. I have a bunch of object magazines, lots of object magazines. Well, there was no internet. And I'm sure a lot of the kids nowadays are like, wow, no internet. Yeah, there was no internet, which has a lot of ramifications. You know, um, there was no PayPal. Um, it, was, it wasn't that easy to get orders. You had to, send, you had to print a catalog and send it out, and the only way you knew who to send it out to was through zines. There was a lot of, a lot of fan zines out at the time, and um, it wasn't always about the quality. We were looking for the information, too, how to get connected to people. Reviews were a great thing because you can go through the review section. These magazines would have pages and pages. Well, everybody was open to getting you know, a tape of yours in exchange for theirs. And uh, friends were made that way. And fanzines were really responsible for that because there's no other way. It wasn't like we had the internet then where we can just, you know, Google people or go onto Facebook. You had to really search it out. And fanzines were the, they were the, the, the main tool for being able to uh, find contacts and find uh, kindred spirits. I didn't like the actual contraction zine, but magazines uh, and it always sounds like it should be slick but and uh, so mine was called the zombies dot trade journal trade journal is is more of the way i thought of it is a trade journal type thing is that these uh trade journals let's just call them that if if i may uh, uh, they were coming out were about specifically about the the craft and the art of underground music hence a trade journal kind of concept and they were yeah they were real important i mean you would, the reviews the things you found out about the contact and of course everybody was strictly male uh, that is writing letters uh the good old post office Sure, we we had the people in Europe were good with coming up ways of doing it cheaply. Like you put uhu on top of the postage stamp and mail it, and then on the other end they can wipe the <laughs> wipe the uh, the cancellation off and use it again, or or put it no such address and <laughs> repackage it. It was a problem because I like I said I was broke back then too, and it it was a much bigger commitment to contact somebody. Uh, overseas, you know, at the to, to the tune of 95 cents when you didn't practically have any money. Part of Sound Choice was to give publicity to artists who were doing stuff that just wasn't going to be picked up by the mainstream, you know, uh, more or less, uh, because it wasn't part of the the system. And that time, the radio stations, the commercial radio stations, and some extent the college radio stations and uh, ma magazines, they were all like part of this big record industry. They all like fed off each other and they promoted just certain small minute amount of bands. And it, for us who like got us uh, like a look out underneath the, the tent, you see there's this whole other world of music. I think that I have always tried to maintain a sense 
of community. To me, there are four basic pillars of the DIY home taper cassette culture ethic or aesthetic, and that those are contact, uh, community, collaboration, and compilations. It's all about, it's not just about me. It's what I can do to connect with other people, with other artists. And in recent years here in Florida, I've become involved in more live performances. And I have set up uh, events such as the Dictaphonia Fest, which was based on micro cassette performances, or I did six of the laboratory music improvisation festivals. Anybody and everybody who wanted to was welcome to participate. And I think it's important to, for us older home tapers or experimental music people from the 80s to always remember that there are new people who have an interest. They just need a little encouragement. Like my newest project, the Museum of Microcassette Audio Art, the only requirement is that you have a microcassette recorder. I don't care who you are, where you live, I'll send you two tapes and you send one of those tapes back to me with anything on it you want. You decorate the tape any way you want and keep the other tape to give to a friend, to pass it along, to keep it going. I think that's, that's what's most important for me in terms of support. Support has to start with me, you know, and it spreads out from there. When you're performing live and collaborating with people, you're hitting a whole new level on that razor um, of whether it's going to work or not. But it really does, because what it does is it really forces you to listen. And I, as a non-musician, find that I really have to be good at, 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 at least as good at listening as I am at playing. Um, that, that's the real skill. That's what, that's what collaborating teaches you an awful lot of. It's like listening. When, when are you supposed to talk? When are you supposed to converse back? Um, what is the dialogue? How does it flow? And how did the two of you dialoguing dialogue outside of just the two of you? So you say that term non-musician, so you feel like you're a non-musician making music. Yeah. I've got good ears. I, and I'm good with my fingers, so I can use the technology to, but most songs are math. <laughs> so if you can do some basic math skills, you can figure out how to put most music together.
my background, of course, my mother's a piano teacher, uh, so I was raised listening to things like the Brahms variations on a theme by Haydn and so forth. Uh, of course, uh, what we really liked when we was a t when I was like up until sixth, seventh grade was sixth grade anyway was Tijuana brass. But I was got interested in trumpet, so I started coronet trumpet in grade school. Switched to French horn in, in junior high, and by that time Clockwork Orange comes out, and that became this thing about how great classical music is. So Beethoven's Ninth in that movie, for example, or La Gazza Ladra by uh, Rossini, and then from there I started, you know listening to, to classical music like and maybe even a little bit stoned doing it. <laughs> so the background's classical music in the end. Music with a beat was something I had avoided because it, classical music's not like that. It's it's a it's a it's a, a floating melody more than it is uh, something like a boom boom boom. So then uh, you know getting into the experimental music was where that was freed up. Starting about uh, 1980 or so, 81. Uh, so Sound of Pig, which was my cassette label, started in 1984. But for probably about two years before that, I started buying, finding about cassettes and buying cassettes. Uh, again, Op. You know, when I first started buying Op, they had probably 10 reviews and each issue, and it started expanding. And you know, it was a pre-internet, so the fact that. Um, I can read about somebody's music that sounded kind of interesting and write them a letter and say I'd like to you know originally buy your cassette or get your cassette and someone would send me a cassette after I sent them money and over time I mean, part of the reason I started the cassette label was just the fact that you know I didn't want to just buy cassettes I wanted to trade you know since people were willing to trade product I you know figured well let me you know there's a lot of interesting things I'm starting to find there's a whole range of music it went from you know really weird pop stuff to noise to uh, punk, I mean, especially in the early days. I mean, I think over time uh, there was a, I don't know if a schism, but you know, if you, if you go, if I go back to my early tapes or some of the early tapes I'd got from people, you know, a cassette compilation could have punk, noise, pop, uh, folk, oddities. You could send something and three people could hear it and you were happy. It was, it was, it was, it was a, it wasn't, a, again, it's, it's, it wasn't about making money and it wasn't about making a living. It was about making music and, and connecting with people. We wanted more, I think, back then for people to experience it on our level. The limited uh, amount of access and the way the culture was. Now it's almost like it's too wide open. You have just turned into Mystery Hearsay International. The video show with a difference here on your public access channel at Memphis Cable Vision. It m makes it harder to sound fresh because you're, you're battling against uh, really time and mortality. It catches up much more, I think, in the modern world because it's, just, it's disseminated so much more quickly and uh, acceptance is uh, much more fluid. Back then you had more opposition and more uh, oppression from the, the norm.
Crawling with Tarts started as an offshoot to another band that I was in, a sort of New York style thrash punk rock band called Youth Camp. And I joined that band in Ventura. We lasted about nine months until the bass player and I split off, Suzanne Dykus and, and myself. Um, and we, uh, we, we didn't mean to form Crawling with Tarts. What we were really doing was we were putting out this zine called Youths Go Camping related to this band, the other band. And uh, finally, I think it was the seventh edition of the magazine had a cassette in it, which we called rather randomly Crawling with Tarts. It's from a phrase by uh, Jacques Prévert. And um, so we were just really making What's it What's the up. context of the phrase? Uh, the Secret Paris of the 1930s by Brassai. And there's a, should have a marker on the page. There's a there's a Jacques Prévert is uh, in, in introducing it, and he said. He said. I also spent several nights in, in the neighborhoods around the Bassin de Villebre de Jacques Prévert, where we reveled in the beauty of sinister things. Quote. He used to call the pleasure of those deserted quays, those desolate streets, that district of outcasts crawling with tarts full of warehouses and docks gave us. So it's set, it's set apart in, in with commas. <laughs> Crawling with tarts. I'll take my uh, recording sessions from my GarageBand on my iPhone and then I'll put them on here in GarageBand and then I will drop a remix onto my Zoom recorder and I'll take that into the basement and uh, put go into the vocal booth and then I'll take that vocal and put it in here and uh, do a little remixing. On my first recordings are using borrowed cassette decks and layering things just either through mic line inputs or through open air and now it's like a fifty dollar cell phone bill and a thirty dollar internet bill and for a hundred dollars a month i'm purely covered to to connect to people internationally it's a just yes <laughs> Europe has allowed me to concentrate on the concept of what it is that I'm doing. And when I finally brought my music and my experimental stuff to the audiences of Spain, they're open for it, not for how I should be like exploiting it, but for what it really is. You know, they didn't want to know about you know, this label or how you should do this after Concert in America guys come up to you like, oh, you should be doing this and this and this. In Europe they're talking about, oh, that was amazing, this art thing, and do you know about this, and what about this, and they're, they're talking about the art of it all. I love playing out live. I've always loved playing out live. I've been playing out live a lot lately, which is great. You know, I love. You know, I got different projects. You know, circuitry room. I got central inhabitants. So I got these different groups that I'm involved in, and I just love playing out live. I don't know what it is. I think it, the feeling is more like it's. It's just uh, I'm, I'm I'm expressing myself through sound.
Improv is all I do. Free form improv, whatever you want to call it. We have no preconceived ideas of what we're going to do at any time. We just set up, turn everything on, blast out for about 45 minutes, turn everything off, go home. We kind of have a sense of style um, where we listen almost more than than normal people really do. I mean, we really listen to what we're doing. Improv is just the way, I think, to have fun uh, and, and not knowing what's going to happen next. The Living Archive was important to me because there's the archive of stuff that already exists. And yet, I didn't want this to be just about dusting off the spider webs from my cassette collection. I wanted to find a way to resonate this into the future and show the direct link between those days, even pre-cassette recording days, to now with MP3s and all the different things that we do now. So I wanted to, uh, to show the continuity between uh, home taping then, home taping now, and how it's really become blurred because even, even Nine Inch Nails does home recording now, you know? So it's, the whole world is different now. Recently, and we talk about the cassette coming back, I got a tape from this guy named uh, E. Danziger. His tape is called Ghoul Misogyny. And check this out. It comes in a Shiva baby vagina um, um, where the tape goes in. <laughs> and I go, well, how many of these did you make? It, I guess he made like eight or something like that. And I was honored. I sent him one of my tapes and he sent me this. He sent me this in return. And that's a lot of work to go through to give somebody your tape. I use that four track cassette recorder to this very day. I've been you been recording some new albums with that this year in fact. Uh we have this move over here. He huh? some, what is talk about this stuff? Oh okay. Well I have oh Sorry. I've got uh three of the uh the, the Mo Moger Fogers. These are uh, these are uh synthesizer modules. Uh, this is my favorite, the Freak Box. Sometimes I will do live performances with nothing but this and a small mini mixer hooked together in a feedback loop, and that's rather awesome. I've got CDR masters of every tape that I, I've ever released. So what I do is I, I play back the master CD here and make a co two copies at a time on this dual cassette deck. Uh, interestingly, the, this one, uh, this TAC here, costs about 178 bucks, and the $325 Tascam deck I just wore out has identical identical specifications. But Tascam is the professional division of TAC, so it costs 125 dollars more. Uh, but anyway, here's some more various tapes of uh, recent production. Uh, uh, I'm trying to keep up 240 tapes in print right now. The roots of the whole home taper thing was the mail art movement. I think it's, that's one of the, the, the roots it grew out of. And I, I get a big thrill out of getting pieces of mail. And so, you know, Debbie and I were getting, uh, in the cause and effect days, we're getting hundreds of packages a year. I'll release my tape, please distribute my tape from it just seemed like all over the place, all over the, the planet Earth. That's what was exciting to be, was to be in touch with all those artists, all those people making their own artistic statements in a very personal way. And here's something they mailed to me. The internet is the logical extension of what we were doing in the 80s in terms of, uh, of you know, uh, openness of communication, sharing, and things like that. The, the, the real key and the challenge is to make that personal in the same way that we may have done in the 80s. So that's why I still rely on low-tech technology like micro cassette recorders, crappy little video cameras, cassettes, CDRs. 
uh, and even low bit MP3s as an aesthetic practice to kind of step back away from high technology and give it more of a personal gritty kind of like uh, bare bones down to earth feel. <laughs> My Luddite world. Oh, a turntable even. The same turn, well actually it's not the same turntable I've always had. But it's the second turntable I've had. the one you had. inherited from your grandpa. <laughs> 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 and here you have the infamous Casio CZ1000. Babusco will not play anything else. This is the only thing Babusco will play is this Casio CZ-1000. It's something she found in the trash in the 1980s, and she just took to it. So, you know, we can't get her to play anything else. She's kind of an old-fashioned lady. <laughs> The big thing for Walls of Genius was we, we I mean, we, we kind of traded about two cassettes for every one that we sold. And we sell, and so that's how I got a lot of my cassettes, was from trading and also from doing a radio show. And people would, knew about me and set, would send me cassettes. But we did trade a lot. Uh, that was part of the scene, so that's, we, we, we participated in that and we made a lot of connections. It was, Good to hear what people were doing and have relationships, pen pal relationships with people who were in the same scene that we were in. It's a constant flow of things from garage sales. Recently there's like seven new lunch boxes here, which I haven't quite figured out how to put up. I like figures. This is a nice item is this still. This is a six gallon still, which I hope to fire up this summer. And then, you know, toys and, and uh, like frogs having drinking. This is an amazing item. Let's see if your camera can catch this. This is a nice pre-World War I German. But look at this. Can you see the inside of the... Do you see the figure inside? Yeah. That this was uh, something that somebody had, in World War II, had gotten a whole lot of, a lot of these because they would trade them for cigarettes, because cigarettes was money. And I knew that, that they existed, and I got this for a dollar at a garage sale. What we're making is musical adventure. But the, the sweet spot in a, in a, in a long-term musical adventure piece is where you're transfixed in time. And it's as if, you know, you're just sort of trans... First of all, you're transfixed, and time is nonsense at that point. Hypnosis has got a, a melody by Charles Ruggles that sounds like a hymn, but it has all of these other sounds that are coming out of a Kumar synthesizer, uh, actually a little Casio running through a delay. And, and once those all hit exactly the right combination, then that transfix transfixing feeling and moment happens. But it's not a you know, moment isn't what it is, it's this other element of time, where time is sort of, I guess it's standing still. And those are the real exciting pieces for me as well. This is the card I got informing me that the Canadian Customs confiscated my LP on Ron Lassard's label because it was sexually perverted and violent. <laughs>
whatever. I type that, reduce it, lay it out, and this was how we basically did catalogs back then. We would have to go and Xerox the picture, reduce it down super small, type all this out, paste it on here. Um, that's how you did a catalog back then, and cassette covers and all this was cut out with an X-Acto knife. Um, now you can get labels that you actually peel like that, but I cut this out manually. May 11th of 1987. There's Reagan on the cover. Yay. And here we are. Um, talking about... Right here, Hal McGee, Debbie Jaffe, cassettes, cause and effect. Pretty cool. Here I am. And I always thought it was humorous that I was in this computer geeky magazine and I was becoming a geek, so it kind of fit. And um, that's when I did the CD-ROM. It was mostly about the CD-ROM that I had done. I became a real computer geek. Back in like 1994, I kind of recognized that the World Wide Web was going to be this big deal and I wanted to learn how to do it. Um, I taught myself HTML, I taught myself how to design websites, and I, within, by 1996, I was creating websites. I was in on the, the dot-com thing back then, and um, I've basically been doing that ever since, where I just do websites, businesses, um, I'm an entrepreneur. Looking back on all the work that I've produced over the many years, something unconscious that I was doing is using the, the, the spoken voice a lot. What was that like? Chopping it up, mixing it up, turning it into sound. Um, and I never had thought that this is what I'm setting out to do. But I see that it is kind of a theme for me. Um, not everything I do does that, but I would say, looking back on it, there's a lot of that in there. Um, I really started off making let's say artwork with sound, doing painting with sound. It wasn't about the music, and I don't consider myself a musician, but I'm, I'm making collage that is audio collage. So I take real world sounds, and in the old days, pre-sampler, taking them, using a splicing block, <laughs> pushing things backwards and forwards on reels of, reels of tape. So when the sampler arrived, that was just a thing of beauty because it was doing what I was doing and it was a machine that was helping me do all of this stuff. That was just perfect for me. Take all those real world sounds, record them, put them in the sampler, and manipulate them. There's more to music than music. So in other words, the whole idea that music should be based on, uh, on other music is, is to me a strange one. If you're going to work in a medium, and it could be anything, um, I work as a scientist and so I find that the best scientists that I work with are ones who have other backgrounds. You know, some people studied history, some people are musicians or whatever, and they bring this into their scientific work which gives them a certain uh, perception, a certain creativity, a certain, uh, a certain ability to take ideas from places that are unexpected. If you just make music based on the history of music and, and on the other music that you hear other people making, it's it's likely to be less interesting.
don't I don't go about it intentionally, but uh, but I do have a large collection of transcription discs, which are these records that people could make at home between the 20s and all the way up to the 70s, I suppose, or or with other machines, and uh, they're recordings of of people saying, uh, reading a letter out to somebody, or improvising or a letter or whatever, or playing the piano or. Uh, recording their family party or their kids or something like that. Um, they're fantastic source material. I use them for making other music. In a way, this is a library of ephemeral recordings, things that were made for, uh, not for music at all. Nobody, seem, nobody else seems to want them. It's amazing. I find them in places like, for example, an estate sale where someone's trying to sell all of someone's stuff and the family doesn't recognize that they have their recording of that very person or maybe they don't care about it or whatever, but there it is for sale. I've actually at times brought this up to the, to the, the sellers and said, are you sure you don't want this? Because this is a recording of your dead grandmother. <laughs> whatever. And uh, no one ever seems to want them. So anyway, uh, uh, the, the content of those records is, is great enough. If it weren't for that, the fact is, is that they're all so poorly recorded that, uh, that you can make music just with the noise and the fact that they, they suddenly end by crashing the, the needle into the paper and the, and the loop and so you get beautiful loops out of these things and anyway they're, 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 they're brilliant source material. One of our most recent projects, and uh, I think what is kind of helping us get through these times of uh, format insecurities, is doing a, a radio show every week, live, improv, with guest. And we do it from here, from our home studio, and uh, broadcast it to Europe's oldest pirate radio station, and it's webcast from there. And we've done well over 300 in a row now. Um, no matter where we've been, we've been able to grab a couple laptops. If we've got Wi-Fi, we can broadcast. And uh, it's been really great because we've got an audience. You're on that razor's edge of improving with an audience there, but I can be sitting there with no pants on and it's okay, or and I don't have to drag my equipment out of the house, and uh, we can have wonderful guests, and they're not always here either. Sometimes we've actually had guests by Skype, and uh, then we pipe that over to uh, the radio station. So, using the new technology. It's the radio show, pretty much. Um, yeah, being able to do the radio show from here, is, it's expanded, it's gotten more delivered all the time, but we're able to use NiceCast on one computer and then uh, do all the PSAs, all the other thing on one other computer, and then I have one computer left to play. <laughs> Unless I'm over on the other side playing with everybody else, but yeah, we're easily, and I also use the setup for recording BCO and everything else that we do. I think a lot of experimental music art is aggressively political just by its stance anyway. I think it's very valuable to do that. I think it culturally sits you in a place. I think that a lot of experimental artists tend to think about their place in the culture and uh, well, a lot of what art is and music is, and I'm blending the two, like the arts, 
is reflection? Is the artist taking in all that's around them and regurgitating it through their little body filter? I don't think that I made the decision to be alternative, yeah, though. Yeah, just are, right? Yeah, I just, the, yeah. It just sort of happens because we like certain things. And yeah. Where that becomes political is because um, it becomes political by itself because it's a decision to not really be... Play the game. Play the game. We're not and playing the game everybody else did. Yeah, because a lot of people are just driven by money. Right. And and that, frankly, is not like a denominator. Um, I've always worked at least enough to cover my job, you know, my bills and all that. So I'm not depending on the music to pay my bills. And I, and I enjoy that. And I, and I have to have it that way. things that uh, challenge their their way of thinking and their thought process. You know, Do you think uh, the public are like that? You think the public at times, are? yes. Uh, and um, then again, artists can be the same way. <laughs> so it's it's like... Uh, <sighs> so as you've done it's this... It's a quest, I guess. As like the years have passed, and you've done this for, you know, fair amount of time now, uh, have you three felt, decades. Yeah, three decades. You look at it like that, and it's yeah. like scary. Have you felt appreciated? Um, yeah. When I saw that question, I was like, uh, I could see someone getting upset <laughs> by you know uh, taking it the wrong way and say, "What do you mean? What kind of question is that?" Uh, of course, I feel appreciated, you know. But really, it's uh. It's sort of like what Martin Atkins uh, kind of brought to light in one of his um, seminars that he held across the country with his uh, entrepreneurial exploits with uh, uh, Turing and, and uh, independent you know, record company uh, and promotion uh, activities and, and whatnot. It's, you have to come to a, a realization that uh, what you're focused on and what you really like is not going to be uh, that important to other people. So you have to get that out of the way right at the beginning and realize that uh, you have to be s satisfied with what you get out of it and uh, not hold too much weight to that aspect of it because uh, I feel a lot of times with this kind of uh, uh, or that level of participation in something like this, uh, if you thought about that often enough, you would just give up. Over the years, the arrangement uh, changes, but right now what I have here is American home taping artists alphabetically. This goes geographically from England and south, and then it progresses uh, east, and so you'd have England and France and Holland. Down here you get to Asia, you know, like uh, crazy mad fifth column stuff from Japan. And then above here you have multi-track masters. You have a really crazy collection of cassettes that people sent me to collaborate with. I came back from the post office, went to the post office one day seeing a new wave song, My Baby Does Her Hair Do Long, and when I pull this out of the uh, package, it's got a handle, a roll, so it's got a handle on it. Many of these would have two tapes, one per side. And so I would take these and dub these off uh, at real speed and send them to people. And that's how I got that entire wall of cassettes in exchange was by uh, dubbing these cassettes. And nowadays, 
it's like we're so spoiled for it. It's what do we look up? Where do we look it up? How do we find it here? And it's there. And back then, nobody lived in a city so hip that that this whole home taping thing was everywhere. You could just go out and have home taping night and meet these people and do these things. This stuff wasn't there. So it was a uh, the community built around this was a community that had um, invested itself into it in an interesting way as opposed to a contemporary community of a Facebook or a MySpace or something has has no money, no physical reason but more of a motivational reason. Back then you could tie up all the, your motivation, the money, the effort, the time, all uh, these things into something that would make a network and make a, make something beyond your thing, something, make you and what you do part of a bigger picture. I wish I was 50, as a matter of fact. I wish I was 50, but I don't remember that. Just something that I'm drawn to. It's what I do. I don't watch TV. I don't do... I, this is what I do. Back in the days, the early days of tape trading and recording, people did collaborations. You'd send them a backing track. They'd add their part. You'd mix it together. That's your tape. I continue to do that even now, but the quality is much higher because we can do... We can do digital files. I'm working on an album now with 14 different improvisers where I send them improvised tracks, they record the improvised solo, then I mix it into a long suite. My show's called No Pigeonholes. I've been doing it continually since 1984. I started on a station called KKUP, which is in the San Jose area, and I am on several different radio stations now worldwide. And it's kind of, I even have a splitter show called No Pigeonholes EXP now, over the last three years or so, where I play, I feature experimental music. Because the, the No Pigeonholes format is basically that. It's everything from hip hop, punk rock, indie rock, singer, songwriter, experimental. I mix them all into a brew and I call it no pigeonholes. Most people, you know, they download things now and I hate that. I hate downloading. I hardly download anything unless it's the only way I can get that music. That's about the only time I, I will download anything. Otherwise, I want physical product. I, I'll take cassettes, I'll take CDs, I'll take vinyl, I'll take anything that I can tangibly touch, feel, look at, you know, and yeah, that's that's just the way I've always been. Do you think there's a resurgence in the collector movement, people wanting actually to get objects? Um, I think there will always be people that, that like physical, tangible objects. I mean, records today are, are more popular now than they have been in a long time. Even cassettes are coming back, so the kids are getting into this stuff, which is great. I love to see, you know, kids getting into records, you know, I mean, because that's what I got into. And they do sound better. I use some analog equipment. Um, I use two iPads, an Apple, um, Ableton Life. Um, I use uh, some of the analog equipment is the Arturia Mini Brute. I got three Monotrons, a Chaosolator Pro, and, uh, and then just vintage equipment like this old drum machine which used to belong to a, to a Hammond organ. Technology has affected basically everything I do. Um, you know, um, I, I grew up, you know, with just very minimal type equipment um, that had some kind of technology, you know, uh, harness to it. The first, you know, personal computers, uh, the Commodore 64 is what I had. I got disenfranchised with music altogether with all my keyboards and stuff, and I ended up selling them all. And, uh, and technology kind of brought me back in uh, when, I, when I found out all the things you can do with, so with iPads. I didn't think anything I, I was doing was interesting anymore, and I couldn't get any interesting sounds out of the keyboards that I had. Didn't do music for probably about seven years. Yeah. How did you feel? 
during that time period? Not too bad. I mean, it was I wasn't missing a whole lot. Technology uh, hadn't caught up to me yet, I think. When the iPad came out, I, I noticed a lot of things you can do uh, with interfacing devices. With the iPad, it's, it's neat because you're playing music with, uh, with your hands uh, versus uh, playing an actual instrument. Um, that uh, uses dexterity and knowing what notes are because I have no idea what a note is. I totally play improv. The band name If Buana, you know, is an acronym for It's Funny But We Are Not Amused, uh, which partially just comes from my love of uh, Monty Python and um, you know, the sort of, it was always sort of the, uh, the uh, their, their, when their fake queen was like, oh, hello everybody. And so it was sort of like, and, 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 and when I started in 84, it was like, uh, everyone had pseudo band names. So this is just, you know, this is, what do I call it? And one day it would just become if, so it was if comma water. <laughs> Last night uh, in Hudson, uh, at a great little space called a Spotty Dog, a cafe, which is a bookstore, beer store, live performance space. Uh, I played with uh, Guy de Biev, a Belgian composer uh, and guitar and lap steel guitarist, and uh, Peter Zumo, a trombone player. We performed a piece of Guy's, and this was the first time I played with him. And I was sitting there, and I had some percussion instruments and a, a little Roland micro composer, uh, mono synth, which is nice and very lap sized. get into this thing there's you know a level of where they think there's you know I mean from the get-go people thought they were gonna make a living or make money or oh yes my cassettes gonna sell what tens of millions <laughs> I mean there weren't that many but you know but you know even even doing this can be for some people a way into you know maybe this maybe there's a way of you know I mean I'm shocked that I make a, I'm shocked that I made a living doing music you know as a career for 20 years or 20 plus you know again work it's, it was working for record labels that were non you know non-commercial record labels but you know I mean I'm, I'm quite you know <laughs> So what's this? This is the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. And this is at like the southern mouth of Tampa Bay. For anybody that's been involved in uh, homemade experimental music for 25 or 30 years, it's just, it can wear you down. I mean, because you're not always getting the kind of material rewards for what you're doing you know you're not necessarily getting fame there's no money in it so you have to do it for the love of it primarily out of necessity because that's what you live for and that's what I live for I, I, I like to tell people uh, you know when they ask me how do you get so much done you're so prolific you've put out so many compilations like 75 compilations and 250 albums over the years how do you do all that and I tell them because I have absolutely no other interests in life literally no other interests except for my dog and going to work and drinking coffee ladies and gentlemen Al McGee
Thank you. I know Hal is like a godfather of noise down in Florida, and that's cool. He should be. You know, Hal should be a godfather of noise. These people who were involved in the 80s should be revered by the young people because we really did blaze a path. I really believe that. And we did not think that at the time. It never really latched on because it's so personal and so extreme. The, the majority of people don't want that, you know, and I hate that. It's like the beige mentality, the conservative, and it's worse now. You know, it was really bad in Indiana um, in the 80s, you know, because it was so conservative. But now with the Republican right wing and the, the Tea Party and the NSA and all this crazy stuff going on, it's worse. And, and people have a lot to rebel against, and they don't. I did not feel appreciated back then. Um, I mean, I felt appreciated by some of the reviews, some of the people, some of the magazines, um, none of them in Indiana. Uh, but as far as generally feeling appreciated, no, no. Back then, no. I felt like, you know, I had the com a complex that this is weird, no one's going to understand it, and the few people who do, great, but that those are anomalies. <laughs>
But the main thing is, why are you doing it? Are you doing it because you love it? If you love it, that's all that matters, really. You're going to keep doing it. Anyone who does this is, is, is in rebellion because you don't want to be part of everybody else. You're not buying into what everybody's doing. This is, this is, it's, it's, your, it's, it's expressing your individuality, which you know, is less and less wanted. And so, as, and again, as I kind of mentioned before, it's this kind of thing also, any, and again, it's not just music, but I mean, it's music, but if you're, you know, if you're an avant-garde writer or a filmmaker or, or any other form of that, it's not doing something that's commercially acceptable, then you are resisting. One time I was living in low-income housing and I didn't have a job or any money and I had my son and I had put up a flyer and the authorities found out about it and they called me in at the housing authority you're you're making money I said we don't make any money and, and she said oh so you're a volunteer group and I said yes <laughs> so actually architects office has been volunteer experimental music making group all these years What I am doing in that sense by making these tape collages is I'm reorganizing reality in a way that's more suitable to me. Sometimes modern life can be very disorienting. It kind of blows your mind. There's, it's just so much sensation coming at you, so much confusion, so much you know, stimuli and random phenomena. With a tape recorder, it's a form of directed attention. So by turning my attention to that sound or that sound phenomenon, I am in a sense changing it by observing it. I mean, that's a pretty basic concept, but I do believe that with tape you can change reality. Of course, not actually, but 
if you're walking down the street and you hear you know a car horn over here and a dog barking over there and people yelling over here it's just this random mess but I can I can create a musical composition in my head by arranging it or organizing it again a pretty basic concept but with a tape recorder that becomes concrete in a, in a real sense in a physical sense I mean there's something about a tape recorder it's very tactile so I feel like that's me engaging with my environment. The Chinese fortune cookie says, a new challenge is near. You know, I've been working at this for 25, 30 years. It's my life. If I can share some of that with other people and give them the desire to share their life through their audio art, you know, I, I figure my life's work, that's, that's what it's all about.